So flash forward, now I'm writing this book about Cuba and my editor says, oh, your hero's not macho, Hispanic, Latin, tough enough. And I'm like, well, that's funny. I married a macho Latin tough guy. So I went to my macho Latin tough guy and I said, um, I, I need you to help me with this book. So I would just literally follow him around our rooms while he was painting, read him dialogue. And he'd be like, oh, no, 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 that's not what, you know, that's not what Antonio would say. And so he would change the dialogue. This week, I got to talk with Linda Hurtado Bond, who is the author of multiple series. Um, but the book we'll be talking about today is All the Missing Girls. And it is a fast-paced action thriller that takes place in Cuba. There's no way for TV news crime reporter Mari Alvarez to get back into Cuba except illegally. But with her estranged sister missing and likely under the control of the guy who killed her mama, Mari has no choice but to enter the country on an unregistered boat in the dead of night. Now she has 48 hours to find her sister, take revenge on her mother's killer, and escape before the authorities even know she's there. But there's nothing simple about it. With few contacts and a trail of cryptic clues, Mari and Detective Tony Garcia, along with her ph photographer, are caught up in a maze of lies, deceptions, and a sinister undercurrent of brujeria, witchcraft. Every lead draws Mari further into a world of shadows, and it soon becomes clear that her sister isn't the only young woman who's gone missing. But there's no one here that they can trust, and as they close in on the horrifying truth, one thing becomes clear. No one will let them leave Cuba alive. This is a nail biter if I ever read one. It is action packed and it will have you guessing until the very end. And I love talking with Linda about how her job as an anchor um, has influenced her writing and the inspiration for this book. So that being said, let's hear from Linda. So before we dive into all the missing girls, I did want to get to know a little bit about you, Linda. So when did you know you wanted to write a book or when were you like, I want to be an author? Gosh, that started really young. I think I've been writing. I was I was the nerd in high school that walked around with like the notebook under her arm and would just in a pencil because we used pencils back in the day, you know, <laughs> and just write whenever I had a chance. And I was, you know, I was writing a romance when I was I didn't even know what romance was, you know, in middle school and high school. So I've always wanted to be a writer, but I never thought I could make a living as an author. I did never occurred to me you could make enough money. So mm -hmm. I went the journalism route which was kind of um, a combination of everything I love anyway, you know, being um, a current events I love. I grew up in the theater, so there's a little bit of performance mm. aspect to television news and and you write. So it was kind yeah. of a combination of everything I loved. So that's kind that's of how I, I went into journalism. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and how did, so you are an, a news anchor now, and it sounds like you've done some other jobs related to journalism. How does that, how does that affect your writing of fiction? Well, they go ha hand in hand. I did actually have to take a lot of classes and because basically as a journalist, a television news journalist, I have to tell somebody, somebody's story in two minutes. That's, that's it. So you're really whittling down a story into who, what, why, where, and when. That's it, yep. the bare minimum. So when now you're going to write a 400 page book, you have to learn a whole different uh, type of prose and type of writing. I had to learn story structure. I had to learn what a three act st story structure was. I had to learn um, how to how, how to stretch out a story and dive into more emotion. And so I ended up going to a lot of writers conferences. Um, and, and then taking online courses and still today, like sometimes on the way in to, to work, I'll listen to, um, craft books like story genius by Lisa. Clark. Yes. I, listen to. I love her. Um, or I'll listen to on writing by Stephen King or masterclass. They, mm -hmm. uh, Shonda Rhimes was the last one I listened to because I was, put, I'm putting together a TV pitch deck to try to sell my series. And so nice. I wanted to, I wanted to listen to her because she's the yes. ultimate TV writer. Right. So I don't know. I'm always learning. You can always yeah. become a better writer. So they're different. Writing as a journalist and writing as a novelist are definitely mm -hmm. different. Yeah, it is like the you're you kind of have to lean into the fact that there is a bigger attention span for a novel than for the news, for sure. And maybe you don't know everything about writing. And so, you know, open your mind up to the fact that uh, there's still a lot to learn. Yeah, <laughs> so that's kind of, kind of what I did. 
that's it's also really cool you mentioned story genius because you um we got connected through jamie lynn hendrix um and i was telling you the way i got connected to jamie lynn hendrix was ashley winstead and mm. ashley winstead and when she was on this podcast brought up how story genius is what she uses to write all of her books so we've just got connections everywhere <laughs> right it's that was a game changer for me because what she wrote really made sense if you're a thriller writer it's like yeah. how to addict the brain so mm -hmm. that people can't put the book down and they have to turn yeah. the next page and she came up with a formula that really works and yeah. if ashley's using it that's just more confirmation that it works but i use right? it too much for every scene in every chapter yeah i i read it too and i i i agree with everything you're saying it's just like it um because i've been working on a book as well and yeah <laughs> it's daunting but it's so fun but having craft books like was so helpful for me because it helped me like understand like oh there you can be creative and then also here's something that you can like kind of follow and i love how story genius is like all about like the external plot like always bring it back to the emotional change that's happening i i love that part of story genius because that's why ultimately people read and I, I don't think it's you know you could make bombs go off and uh, you know mm -hmm. planes crash whatever because i'm and i say that because right now i'm reading worst case scenario by tj newman and so oh, yeah. this is the biggest disaster book ever right like it's yes. huge but i on the way to work almost cried today listening to a scene where a father realized he was going to die after a crash involving this plane and his son was the only survivor in the back seat and oh. he was talking to his son um saying his goodbye and i'm like i can't believe Oof. in a play crash book she's about to make me cry because yes. it all comes to emotions right mm -hmm. like we all want to feel something so that's why we read and yes, yes the bombs can go off and all those the, the bad guys can chase you and the monsters can come out the bad people anything not going to care and they're not going to read yeah totally I f and I feel like, yeah, sometimes like people think thrillers wouldn't be the spot for that, but like you're feeling all kinds of things in a thriller normally. <laughs> yeah. So how did, so it sounds like you read some craft books. How did mm -hmm. your writing process with fiction develop? So do you plot it out for the most part or do you pants it and just get writing? So I'm a control freak. <laughs> so knowing that, what do you think I do? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to guess plotter. you plot a little bit. <laughs> I'm a total plotter, but I guess it's because I, I'm writing mysteries and mm -hmm. I'm jobs. So for me, it's like, I don't want to write a book and have to rewrite it. Like, so I sell my, my book to my publisher now um, on synopsis. And so I really have to write a pretty complete synopsis anyway. And that being said, there are times the book changes, like either you, my mm -hmm. editor will, will say, okay, the ending didn't work or this twist didn't work or add another red herring character. And, and in, in, a, in a mystery or a thriller with a mystery, um, if you change just a couple of things, if you tweak a couple of things, it changes the whole book. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it doesn't really end up to be exactly what you plotted, but mm -hmm. I need to know the bad guy and I need to know, um, so I can lay the red herrings. So yes. that's what I do plot. Yeah, that's that's how I felt or feel with the one that I'm writing right now. Um, but we keep bringing up Jamie Lynn Hendricks. It blows my mind that she's like, nope, I don't, I don't want to know. I just want to write and find out while I write. And she writes these amazing twisty books. And I'm like, uh, my brain can't even wrap around it. <laughs> so she's my neighbor, also one of my really oh, good nice. friends. Blurbed, blurbed this book for me. Yes. Um, and I, not only does the fact that she pants it all the time blow me away, <laughs> but yeah. how prolific she is. Like, yeah. she'll go into a, her bedroom and shut the door and go, oh, I just wrote 3,000 words. And I'm like, I hate you, which I don't. Of course, I love her. But right. 3,000 words, like, just like that. And, you know, for me, I'm because I, I have a full-time job during the day, um, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous <laughs> that she's got those right? down every day or whatever she's doing, but I'm jealous in a good way. We're buddies and um, oh, I'm yeah. so proud of her. She's a great writer. Yeah. I remember her saying, she's like, I just make my, I can't remember exactly what the number is, but she's like, I just make myself write 1700 words every day. 
And then yeah. I'm like, all right, I can go do the rest of my day. I'm like, well, that sounds amazing. <laughs> and she yeah. Yeah. In Florida, when there's so many distractions all, right? all day, all day, you know, yeah. so many things you could be doing. <laughs> right. Well, my next one is kind of a two part question. I know I saw with your first series that you wrote that it was actually kind of inspired by your own real life relationship. So can you tell us a little bit about that? And then what draws you to writing romantic thrillers? Right. So I guess I should say I, I have two different series out. And the first series is just under Linda Bond. So they are standalone romantic suspense books. So they're kind of like a James Bond movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're going to know there's going to be action, adventure, a mystery, a car chase. You know, the girl gets kissed and, you know, <laughs> and Bond solves the mystery in the end, right? Um, yes. So the second book in that series is called Cuba Undercover. And the reporter is kidnapped and goes to Cuba because uh, the person who kidnapped her uh, needs a story to be told because the media is not a free media in Cuba and knows that um, this reporter won't go unless he forces her to. But he he makes an exchange with her for some information on her father who she thought was dead and he's not. He's he's still mm -hmm. in Cuba. So mm -hmm. it's, it's that kind of adventure in Cuba. But at the time, I guess my editor said that my hero um, – wasn't macho enough. <laughs> I guess I should back up. I'll get, to, I'll, I'll get, I'll get to that. So I did go to Cuba as a reporter when Pope John Paul II went to visit Fidel Castro. And I did oh, a yeah. number of stories on families from Tampa and my husband's family was one of them. And that's how I mm -hmm. met my husband. So there is that personal connection. I met mm -hmm. him while reporting in Cuba. Nice. So flash forward. Now I'm writing this book about Cuba and my editor says, Oh, your hero's not macho, Hispanic, Latin, tough enough. And I'm like, well, that's funny. I married a macho Latin tough guy. So I went to my macho Latin tough guy and I said, um, <laughs> I, I need you to help me with this book. And he was painting at the time. So I would just literally follow him around our rooms while he was painting, reading <laughs> dialogue. And he'd be like, Oh no, 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 no. That's not what you know, that's not what Antonio would say. And so he would change the dialogue and I would read him this description of what the male character was doing. And he'd be like, mm, no, I wouldn't. Not, that's not what he would do. And so he helped me write the book literally by doing that. And he also helped me, uh, I think, learn to write better male characters, because I think women write men the way we want men to be. Right. Right. <laughs> in, in general. But yeah. um, I, I guess my editor was looking for really a more macho guy the mm -hmm. way that a real Hispanic guy on the run in Cuba would be. Yeah. Um, and so it taught me a lot about writing male characters and, right. and it was fun to do it together actually. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's really cool. That is kind of cool getting to collaborate that way. Um, so a lot of your books, both of these series actually include like Cuban or Cuban American culture um so can you talk a little bit about kind of like the importance of having that in your books and like it sounds like some of it must be influenced by like working with your husband on it too absolutely and um of course my husband's family so mm -hmm. my dad's hispanic but his family came from guatemala so my husband is cuban he was born in cuba mm -hmm. um and you know his mother it raised all of them to speak spanish helped raise my kids while i was working uh, and they live in West Tampa, which is a Cuban American community in mm. large part. So we raised our family in the Cuban American community. So when you read, especially the second series, which is all the broken girls and all the missing girls, like you go into the kitchen and you're going to smell the sofrito and the onions and the green peppers. And, and, and you're going to hear um, the way the family talks to each other. And I'm going to take you back outside the garden and hidden in the corner for the um, Santeria altar that everybody knows is there. But um, nobody really talks about, and you certainly don't show your American friends that your mom's got an altar out back. Yeah. So like, you really dive into the rich culture. And I wanted, I, I love the culture because it's so family oriented. Um, mm -hmm. and they, if family takes care of family, I, you'll see that too in the books, how mm -hmm. important family is. And I wanted to bring that to, um, society because i don't i love rich cultural books like i love that you're taking when you're taken into um a world that you don't currently live in and learn something about a, a person's mm -hmm. culture Ari alvarez is um a cuban-american reporter and her love interest is is a cuban-american homicide detective her best friend and partner is african-american tv 
photographer. And I just love the fact that um, in my books and my publisher Entangled embraced it. In my books, there you have a very culturally diverse cast of characters. And that was important to me. Yeah, it was really, it was kind of crazy how my reading lined up because I read um, The Lion Women of Tehran by Marjan Kamali right, right before I read your books. And hers did the same thing where she talks really extensively about like being in the kitchen and the smells of their food and like the different food that they make. And also there was like a big emphasis on what the family structure is like as well. And so then when I started reading your book, I was like, this is like different culture, but like kind of the same experience. And she also had a character that was like obsessed with the evil eye. And then like, I read that in like the first chapter of your book and I'm like, what is happening right now? This is crazy, but it is cool. It's cool getting to hear other cultures. I think it shows that although we're very different, aren't we all kind Mm -hmm. of the same? Like, yeah. I love that. The world needs to hear more of that right now. I mean, we can eat mm-hmm. different food and we can practice a different religion. And, but at the end of the day, we love mm-hmm. our family and the kitchen mm-hmm. is where so much happens. And we're all afraid yeah. of evil in whatever form you may think that it's going to come at you, whether it's the evil eye or if you're Cuban, mm-hmm. you wear like, look, I have my evil eye bracelet on right now. Um, nice. Or the Asati charm, which is what Cuban mothers put on their babies. So, um, someone who's who's wishing them ill will even if it's inadvertent it's not intentional mm-hmm. uh, they are protected from that and i think it's a beautiful thing i'm so glad you brought that up because it shows yeah. that even though we're in different parts of the world our hearts mm-hmm. are the same right yeah really? yeah and that cool fact for anyone who's listening that bracelet shows up on the cover of both of your books i thought that was yeah. so cool yeah that's awesome So I know like All the Missing Girls was pretty much picking up from where All the Broken Girls ended up. But Mm -hmm. what was what was your inspiration for this storyline for this book? Uh, This is this is a really cool inspiration. So first of all, I do write all my books as stand. They're they're a series, but I Mm -hmm. write them so they stand alone because I I can't assume that someone that's picking up All the Missing Girls has read All the Broken Girls. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to read them all individually. but they are the same characters going through life, right? Mm -hmm. So what inspired all the missing girls was one of my trips to Cuba. I went to this beach town outside of Havana and it's a real beach town, it's called Fusterlandia. And this artist turned this town magically into a giant piece of artwork. Like the dentist office has mosaic tiles and pieces of art and it looks like a piece of art. And the bench where you'd sit on the bus is a piece of art. And just the whole town is his artwork. And Mm so in my mind, of course, as a writer, I thought, well, that would be the perfect background, a place like that, not that place, but a place like that um, for people to disappear behind the wall. So I changed the name and made it Ocean Via, Ocean Mm -hmm. being the goddess of fertility, a Santeria saint or or Orisha, actually. Mm -hmm. And young girls are drawn there because they either pray for fertility or there's a wishing wall where you can leave a wish you know your greatest wish in life will come true if you post it on this wishing wall so it's Mm -hmm. kind of a magical place and then while I was reading it as I was writing it um, my beta readers were telling me do you know you're writing horror and I'm like am I I thought I was just writing a thriller I've never written horror before so I started listening to Stephen King's The Shining and on Mm -hmm. writing obviously he's the goat of horror just to try to figure out how to pull that off because I've never mm-hmm. written, you know, I went from writing romantic suspense to serial killer thrillers and this yeah. one with the touch of horror in it. And so again, I just studied one of the masters to try to um, bring a little touch of what he does. So it's not, because I think what he does that's so fabulous is it's not necessarily over the top. It's right. just enough to be chilling, but mm-hmm. believable. Right? Mm-hmm. Like the shine. Like, oh, wow. Um, yeah. Chilling. Yes. So. Yeah. I was, I had um, an author, John Fram on earlier in July and he wrote a book that it, he was kind of saying the same thing where he wasn't aiming to write a horror thriller, but there were just like the little aspects of it, especially kind of near the end of the book, which is similar to yours where there's just like enough elements there where you're like, Oh, this is, this is kind of horror, but it's not like what everyone thinks of when you just say horror basically. So that's cool. Right. I hope you find it a little creepy. Yes. Oh, yeah. 
yeah, reading it in the dark at night alone is <laughs> proceed at your own risk. <laughs> Good. I love um, that. <laughs> yeah. So you've mentioned um, Santeria a little bit, and that is like a big focus in the book as well. And it's kind of derived from um, a, a, an African religion and Catholicism kind of all together. So was that something you always knew about or did you kind of research to include that in this one? I knew a little bit about it, certainly not enough. So I did mm -hmm. research and at the University of South Florida, there is a religious professor, professor of religion, mm -hmm. is that the way you say it? Who's an expert in Santeria. So I asked her to read mm -hmm. the book. I would call her with questions. Um, it was really important for me since I don't personally practice Santeria to make sure that it was on, well, you know, it was spot on and respectful mm -hmm. because Santeria is not, you know, Santeria is used for good. And it was really mm -hmm. developed, as I have been told, by um, many African Americans who came to Cuba so that they could practice their religion, uh, even though maybe th their, their owners at the time they were slaves wanted them to be Catholics. So a lot of the Orishas they gave Catholic names to, like Chango is St. Barbara. And so uh, you can see the statue of St. Barbara, but when they mm -hmm. pray to it, they're actually praying to their Orisha Chango. So I thought it was mm -hmm. a, actually a very brilliant way to stay true to themselves and, yes. and survive <laughs> at the same time, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. really cool. Um, also, the story kind of focuses um, around like sisterhood and how you like, what you're willing to do to like save someone that you love as much as your sister. Uh, did you always know that the story was going to be kind of about that bond? Yeah, because again, family in the Cuban American household, family's everything. So my main yeah. character, Mari, loses her mother and her father um, and, and all the broken girls. Also family member who I want because I know if people have read it. Um, yeah. So now you get into all the missing girls and it's literally just Mari and her sister Izzy, but they're mm -hmm. estranged. Um, Izzy is, you know, on the run and, and Mari is determined to bring her back before something happens to her. And then she's, you know, on this earth all alone. And so mm -hmm. there's really a desperation along with the determination to find her sister and bring her back because it's her last mm -hmm. living family member. And so some of the yeah. crazy things and dangerous things they do in mm -hmm. Cuba is motivated by that it's like it's almost like well what do i have to live for if i don't find her because i don't you know Mari's single she'd like to have a relationship with this homicide detective but he keeps kind of mm -hmm. pushing her away and so um this is her family and at yeah. the end of the day she's willing to do just about anything to save her sister yeah yeah those are always i know a lot of listeners i've even talked to to who love like the sister relate sister relationship or like even just like friend relationships being like uh like two women really in relationship um being at the core of books so it is like it's very compelling to read i think i think as we all relate to it a little bit right you want yeah. that love you want that bond mm -hmm. that you don't get to pick your family but mm -hmm. one thing you do learn is that it's an unconditional love like even if right. they piss you off you're gonna go to bat <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. because they're family and we're going to protect family. I might yell at you later when we're at home and the door's shut, but I'm going right. to, I'm going to defend you because you are my sister. Right. Yeah. And it's that thing, you know, family is, um, and, and you could, it's vice versa. You could call up a family member and they're going to help you, even if they're going to lecture you while they do it, <laughs> they're mm -hmm. still going to help. You, right. It's, yeah. it's, it's that thought that there's somebody in the world that you can depend on. Mm -hmm. Even if they're yeah. bad, they're not going to let you down. So you mentioned that Mari's willing to do some dangerous things to figure out where her sister is. How do you approach writing action scenes? Is it kind of like all in your head or do you have to like block it out? How do you do that? So I, I tend to write very cinematically or maybe made for TV because I work mm -hmm. in TV. And when I write on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, I am stripping everything down to the bare minimum, as we talked about. So yep. for me, and as a television news reporter, you shoot the video first. And so you write mm -hmm. the story to the video that you have. And so for me, writing has always been a very visual thing. And mm, so I yeah. see it in my head. Um, I, I've always assumed that these two books and the third book I'm writing that goes in this series, The Phantom Pirate of Gasparilla, 
are going to end up on either TV or on the big screen. Like I've always just assumed that um, yeah. because it they were written that way. Like they were written to be movies. And when I turned in my last, um, my last synopsis for the Phantom Pirate, my publisher said to me, wow, this book is very cinematic because I do see it in my head. When, even when I'm just writing the synopsis, I write it mm -hmm. on the White Snyder um, Save the Cat three story act structure frame. Yes. Yeah, in there. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I visualize everything. So I don't really yeah. block out an action scene. I just visualize what it would look like in my head um, mm -hmm. or, or what it would look like on the TV screen. and kind yeah. of go from there. But there's a lot of action in this book, mm -hmm. which is why I hope men like it because, you know, men tend to like a book with a lot of action in it. And yes, particularly in this book, there is a lot of action. There is. Yeah. Um, so we talked about kind of how with your other series, it was a little bit loosely inspired, but from your life, is there anything, what, is there anything in Mari that is like, that is from you? Like, is there some of you in Mari or was she kind of separate entirely? Well, she's a separate person, but there's certainly, of course, some of my characteristics. She's very determined. Yeah. Um, she's headstrong and probably does things that she's, she's not supposed to. I've been known to do that a time. <laughs> yes. My husband, he'll tell you, I'm, I'm, you know, very independent, <laughs> very headstrong. Um, yes. and as you'll definitely see that in Mari, I think to be a good reporter, especially an investigative journalist, you have to mm. have some cojones, like you have to have some balls, right? Because, yeah. um, you're going to piss people off. You're going to ask the hard questions. You're going to go where you're not supposed to, to get the video until you're asked to leave. Um, there'll be times that you don't break the law, you know where the line is, but you're going to walk right up and put your toes right on that line until someone tells mm -hmm. you to move. So yeah. that kind of gutsiness I wanted to bring mm -hmm. to the character because that's a, yeah. that's a real thing, especially in yeah. today's um, media environment where there's, you know, a lot of angry people out there and yes. some people are not a big fan of the media or journalists or reporters mm -hmm. anymore. Although in my opinion, have a free democracy you don't have a free country unless you have a free media or a free press. yes that, you know my personal yeah opinions. i will defend yeah. will defend these headstrong reporters till the day i die <laughs> yes and we love a headstrong woman over here <laughs> on the podcast and a, a vengeful one too i think that's like the byline is like they took her sister she'll take revenge yes. i was like everybody's gonna love this <laughs> Fact, you know, I'm working for this TV. I'm working on a TV pitch deck that because my publisher actually is going to pitch this for a TV series. Fingers nice. crossed, everybody. Um, yeah. And so the by the byline, the logline, whatever you want to call it, is um, seek justice, but um, oh, what is it? Revenge. So, uh, <laughs> but serve revenge. Seek justice, but serve revenge. In Ooh, other I words, you know, there's a fine line between justice and revenge, isn't there? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this it's series. Fun that in all three books it explores mm -hmm. it does one person's justice become another person's trauma mm. and it went to the yes. end right? so that's the yeah. all three books explore that theme yeah that is so cool well hopefully we'll, we'll all be crossing our fingers for a tv adaptation or movie i'm, ass I'm assuming either would be would be I good. I would say yes to either. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> totally. It would be fun. It would be fun to see Mari come to life and um, yeah, and, and become this person that people can follow, like a Bosch or a Jack Ryan. Um, yes. You know. Oh, I love Jack Ryan. I do. Too. Um, that would yeah, that would be very cool for sure. So. Um, it sounds like you are a reader too. And I've been asking people at the end if they've read anything recently that they loved. So. I, well, I'm reading T.J. Newman right now, um, her worst mm, case scenario. Yes. He's a fantastic action writer. Oh, it's mm -hmm. just so good. It's got the emotion down pat, too. Um, yeah. To, and that's what I read. Okay, so you can tell the kind of books I like because the, the book I read before then is James Patterson and Michael Crichton's Eruption, which I loved Ooh. that, too. So I really think my next series of books, after I get done with the series, are going to mm -hmm. be those high-octane action-adventure thrillers. And I, yes. I'm even toying with the idea of writing under the, the pen name L.H. Bond. So Linda Bond writes romantic mm -hmm. suspense. Linda Hurtado Bond writes serial killer thrillers mm -hmm. or thrillers. 
LH, those big um, cinematic movie type action adventure thrillers, yeah. like a Michael or James Patterson or TJ Newman. And because that's mm -hmm. honestly at the end of the day where I love to read just those big. Yeah. Books. Yeah. I have that same experience. I read it comes out on September 1st, but um, Fatal Intrusion by Isabella Maldonado and Jeffrey Deaver. Oh, and it's oh, wow. kind of similar. It ha yeah, it has like action. It has serial killer. It has like police procedural. It has thriller elements. I can't remember if I already said there are hackers involved. Like oh, there's wow. so much going on. And I was like, I need to read more books like this. Like it's so easy to get totally addicted to them. So my next book, so you're talking about hackers, mm -hmm. the Phantom yeah. Pirate. Gasparilla. Um, I mm -hmm. wanted to, to talk about artificial intelligence because as a journalist, yeah. it's it's really a problem. <laughs> artificial yeah, sure. I, mean, I, think, I think that there are there are great uses for artificial intelligence. And there's no way to get around it. It's here. We all got to learn how to use it, right. incorporate it in really life. But these deep fake videos and audios are so good now. And so yeah. I wanted to play with the idea, what if a serial killer was targeting a reporter that outed mm. him? by uh, making deep fake videos and audio clips and making them go viral through hacking mm. skill and putting her at the scene of crimes and taking wow. her from hero to villain to the point where she could even get arrested and lose her right. freedom. It's totally possible to do today, wow. totally possible. And you don't yeah. even have to be a skilled hacker to do it. So mm. I interviewed a lot of um, cyber security, law enforcement, experts to find out what it is that cops are using AI for today, what are reporters using AI for today, what are criminals using it and how, right? Mm. And how it really mess up your life in a matter of days totally. and you would be able to stop it. So that's what, and then the Phantom Pirate of Gasparilla, because I've always wanted to write a book that takes place during Tampa's Gasparilla. Do you know, are you familiar with that? Mm -mm, I'm not. So it's a month long festival in Tampa based on the legend of Jose Gaspar, a pirate. And okay. there's this grand invasion of boats that come up Tampa Bay. And then these men and women dressed as pirates. And I mean, full out dressed makeup outfits. Wow. They invade the city of Tampa and then they party for a month. So there's parades, there's music festival, there's masquerade balls. There's, um, you know, there's an art festival. It's just, a, it's an excuse to party for a month. But my yeah. thinking was if you're a killer, what a great way to come into the city and hide in plain sight. Everybody's yes. dressed up. Everybody's partying a little tipsy. Everybody's having a good time. And there's 200,000 people in one place at one time. How are they going to yeah. catch you? And wow. it's also a great place to cause chaos if that's what you're looking to do. So yes. that's the third book in the series is The Phantom Pirate of Gasparilla. And that comes out February 10th. Oh, nice. That I love that premise. That is, I, I love when you when authors do kind of like pull really relevant subjects and then apply it to whatever genre they're writing. That's, that sounds right. awesome. Yeah. People need yeah. to know what AI can do. You know, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's got its uses and it's not going yeah. away and I have mucho respect for it, but right. it could destroy. <laughs> That's the yeah, truth. totally. Yeah. Kind of like everything, same thing with like the right. internet in general. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's great because you can connect with people and then other times it's terrible because you do the opposite of connecting with people. Yeah. In and steal your money from your bank before you even know, you know, so right. Good and yeah. evil, right? Yes. Evil. It's always there. Well, since you have, since we've, we've heard all of these future plans of yours, where can people follow you to stay up to date with it? Yes. So there's two ways author Linda bond on social. So on Instagram, mm -hmm. I'm author Linda Hurtado bond. And on Twitter, author Linda Bond, and mm. easy, right? Linda Bond. Um, yeah. My TV reporter social media is Linda Hurtado. Fox 13's mm -hmm. Linda Hurtado. And they kind of cross over because I have a segment on my show called Tampa Bay Reads, where I interview authors. Like I just interviewed TJ Newman, and I got Don Bentley coming up, and um, just interviewed a, a nonfiction writer today on a hundred things to do in Sarasota before you die. So I love that I have this platform nice. that I can use to like you help other authors and interview other yeah. authors. So there's yeah. a crossover. You can follow Linda Bond and Linda Hurtado. Nice. Well, I will put those links in the show notes and thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you. It's been, it's been a joy. You're wonderful. And uh, I'm so glad thank Jamie you. Lynn hooked us up. Yeah.